Okay, so we've been in this uh, series of messages on how God calls us and looking at different people in the Old Testament and, uh, and how God called them into their particular ministries. And um, uh, today we're going we're gonna to look at uh, somebody who uh, is probably the character in the Bible that, that I'm fascinated with. Uh, probably the, the most of, of the different people. And part of it is, uh, in, in James chapter 5, it says, Elijah was a person just like us. Um, some translations say a person of like passions. And he prayed, and uh, it didn't rain for three and a half years, and then he prayed, and it started raining. So it says, but he was a person just like us. And I thought, well, I, I want to get to know this character in the Bible, uh, who is so much like us. And then when you, when you look in 1 Kings 17, 18, around there, and, and you look at what happened in, in Elijah's life and history, you realize, wait a minute, he might be like you, but he's not like me. Uh, this guy was all over the place. He, he's talking trash, and then he's suicidally depressed, and then he's taunting people, and then he's hiding out. And it, it's like, oh, he is like me in every way. <laughs> And a uh, very interesting character in the Bible. Now, uh, before we get into Elijah, I want to tell you that um, I, I grew up in uh, Sunday school and, and in a church <laughs> most of my life. And uh, uh, because of that, I didn't understand what life was like uh, because I'd been taught, I want to say, uh, some misunderstandings about uh, life as a Christian. But it might be that these were heresies I don't want to say there were lies that my Sunday school teachers taught me, but um, I had some misunderstandings. And, and the, the first one was that if you're a Christian, then life is, is going to be prosperous and you're going to have a good life. And I got that early on, and I kept waiting for it to happen, and I wondered what was wrong with me that I wasn't having this prosperous, good life that the Sunday school teachers promised me. And then the second one was that uh, we, it, we can know God's will and then we can, uh, after we understand God's will, then we can make important decisions or do important things because we'll know God's will before we uh, go off and, and decide stuff. And that was another lie. The third one was that um, uh, bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people and bad things don't happen to good people. And because we're all followers of Jesus, then we're good people, so bad things don't happen. So if bad things happen to you as a good person, then you're probably secretly a bad person. That was what I learned. So if something bad happened, it was always, well, <laughs> you see, you weren't really like the rest of us. And so, um, and then the final one, the heresy that I learned um, growing up in Sunday school was, if you do something good, you're going to be rewarded for it, right? Good things will happen to you, too. You'll get rewarded, uh, kind of like, you know, Christ-centered karma. It'll come back around. Now, the problem with that is that basically it, it created a uh, uh, kind of a world of, of uh, trained seal Christians, you know, like a... In San Diego, where I grew up, they had the seal shows. We'd go in. They, the guy always had a bucket of little fish in his pouch, and the seals would go, ar, 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 and then he'd throw the fish. And, 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 and then we became like a church of trained seal Christians. Oh, look, I did something good, you know? And then God would throw us a fish. Uh, and that became what I thought the Christian life was. So you might as well start doing some good stuff because then you'll get the fish. And then I started reading the Bible. <laughs> oh, man, it messed everything up. Because Elijah, Elijah, this prophet Elijah, 1 Kings 17, was just like us. See? And it blew the cover off all the misunderstandings that, that I had. Now, um, Unlike most of the people in the Bible that we've been talking about each week, uh, Elijah takes action 
and goes and confronts the king, the wicked, evil king, without God calling him to do it. He just did it. He was kind of a rambunctious guy. Now, 1 Kings 16 talks about King Ahab and says that he, all the kings were really evil, but then he was more evil than all the kings, right? He tells us that they were, each one was bad, each one was bad, each one got worse and worse and worse, and then he was the worst of all. And, and one of the things that he did was he introduced uh, to uh, Israel uh, the worshiping of fertility gods. And that would make the rain come and make the crops prosperous and make the people prosperous and all those things. And so he introduced Baal worship into the culture and uh, married uh, Jezebel, who was like the high priestess of uh, the uh, fertility cult. And um, so every time it was raining and the good crops and everything, people were praising Baal the fertility god, and turning away from the Lord. And so Elijah evidently saw this happening, and uh, he was a, a, a rural, rural guy, but he goes and confronts the king. And so in, in chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will now be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except of my word, till I say so. That's what he did. confronted the king, said, you're going to have a drought. There'll be no more praise for the fertility god. And, uh, and I'll give the word when that drought's over. Then, only then, does God's word come to Elijah. See, that's so important. God didn't tell Elijah to go do that. He just went and did it and took action and put it all on the line. And then the next verse says, then... The word of the Lord came to Elijah after he did that. That's so different than God coming to Abraham and saying, I want you to leave your father's house and go to the place I'll show you and, you know, take your bit with you. Uh, it's different than Moses where God burning bush and he says, I want you to lead the people out of their bondage and I want you to take them to the place. I'll show you. And, and this was Elijah took action. And then it was like, okay, what now? And God's word comes to him in that moment and says, get the heck out of here. That's the Hebrew. <laughs> Leave here. Go eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. And there you can drink from a brook. And I ordered ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord told him. Isn't that strange how God's word comes to him after the fact? And I, I, that's one of the things I want to say, because we've been looking at how God calls us. He calls us all different ways. We don't have to sit in a, in, a, in a church sanctuary and go, Lord, share with me what I should do, what great thing you have for me. Sometimes it's just obvious that we need to speak out. Sometimes it's obvious we need to take action. Sometimes it's obvious we need to confront uh, leadership. Sometimes it, it, it makes sense in our, in our faith, in our trusting in God's word and looking at the world around us and our reading the newspaper and we go, hey, somebody's got to do this. And so we act according to our faith and according to our beliefs. And sometimes then God comes in and intervenes after the fact and says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Go hide, go east, go to this ravine and stay there. So Elijah does this. Now, the whole country starts to suffer in this drought. And crops are failing, and people are hurting, and dying, and struggling. And, and Elijah's got it kind of cool. You know, he's sitting there. Uh, he's got a little brook taking care of him. He's got ravens. Um, although I did look up, you know, uh, like if you have a bunch of rhinoceros, it's called a crash of rhinos. Uh, you know what ravens are? An unkindness of ravens. Isn't that weird? So he had an unkindness of ravens coming in. They probably had, you know, because they were sort of uh, vulture-esque, uh, predatory, and so as 
animals are dying and things, they're quick and, you know, bring parts of carcasses with them. And then, you know, I, my guess is Elijah probably jumped out of the bushes and scared them and they dropped the food out of their mouth and flew away and he gathered it all up. However it happened, you know. But, um, so anyway, so he was eating and drinking and everything was fine. And you go, isn't that great that God took care of him? He took a step. He got out there. He confronted the evil king. He said, this is what's going to happen. And, and God provided for him. He had safety. He had water. He had food. He didn't have to worry about the drought that was affecting everyone else. And I so wish that the Bible writers would have stopped there. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been great? I warned him, and everything happened, and he drank from the brook, and he was fed bread and meat in the evening and in the morning. Everything, that's where it should end. But verse 7, later, the brook dried up. So now you have somebody who's done the faithful thing, he's acted on what God's told him, he's, 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 he's doing it right, and now he's got nothing. And the brook dries up. You know, we've talked about that before here, and uh, I think all of us from time to time have been in situations where the brook dries up. What, what we thought was God's provision for us, what we thought was, was God taking care of us, with providing and making our life good and whole and full, and we trusted God for it, and then it goes away. What do we do then? How do we live and how do we respond when, when we're doing what God's called us to do and the very provision that he promised goes away? Unless we understand this, we're not going to understand what God's call is in our life. Because we don't have all just prosperity and good times and everybody loves us and everything's super. It doesn't always happen that way. And so the brook dries up. Elijah goes, what now? And he gets another call from the Lord. Another direction. I want you to go to this town, that city, and there's a widow there, and she's going to provide for you, and she's going to feed you, and you'll have a place to stay. Go. And you know what? Okay, here's how the Westfall mind works. I'm thinking, if I was Elijah, cool. Ah, probably some really wealthy widow that has a big inheritance, you know, maybe a mansion, you know. And obviously there'll be lots of servants. No more of this food for the birds thing. Uh, I'm going to get some a wine cellar probably with this wealthy widow and uh, everything's going to be so good and I can't wait Lord thank you for providing for me because I was faithful and you're going to provide for me so off he goes to the town and he gets there to the walls of the city and when he came to the town gate a widow was there gathering sticks and he called to her and said, would you get me a little water in a jar so I can have a drink? Because he's rude. He's been by himself for a long time. <laughs> he doesn't know how to relate. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not making eye contact with any of you. I uh, anyway, bring a little water in a jar. And as she was going to get it, he said, and bring me a piece of bread too. What a loser. Uh, and then she turns and says, well, surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, just a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug, and I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make one last meal for myself and my son, and then we'll eat it and die. He's probably thinking, well, I'm so glad this isn't the widow God has for me. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to make our own meal and eat it and die. And Elijah said, don't be afraid. Go home. Do like you've said. But first, make a little cake of bread for me and bring it to me. 
Then make something for yourself and your son. Because the Lord says, that jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day that the Lord gives rain in the land. Now that is an interesting, interesting tension. Because now not only did he have to act in faith, but now this stranger has to act in faith. And so we have a single parent mom struggling and he's imposing on her and she has to decide whether or not to respond to that. Now, when I, when I look at this, it, it, it kind of boggles me, first of all, that, that she even responded to him. And she obviously is not a person of faith herself, because she said, you know, this, your God said this will happen, but not mine. But what do we got to lose? We just got one meal coming anyway. It's the last one. And so, um, he said, don't be afraid. How would he know to say, don't be afraid? The very thing that the angel said when she, the night that Jesus was born. The very thing that Jesus said every time the disciples were chewed up and torn up and struggling. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God's not done with us yet. Now, the interesting thing here for me is when, when we look at what happens uh, in those dry times in our life, could be relational dry times, uh, could be financial, could be, you know, the great job we had dies, uh, dries up, or uh, could be um, spiritual, we felt like we had this great faith and then it just withered away and we don't feel close to God at all anymore and we don't know why. Um, could be that the accumulated losses in our life pile up and just weight us down so much that we just feel like we're buried under them. We know that happens. It happens in us. It happens with each other. What is it that this scripture is trying to show us about God's call and his involvement in our lives when we're in those dry times? What does this show us? Well, the first thing that stands out to me is that when the stream dries up, aren't we actually more willing to listen to God in a, in a new way that we're not willing to do when the stream's still going? We're taking care of everything's okay. Lord, take care of those people out there who are suffering. We're okay. It's when we get right up to the, the edge of the cliff uh, that we have to make a decision about, am I going to be attentive for God to speak into my life? And am I willing to act on what God tells me? What, what I find in his word? How he speaks into my life? Am I willing to respond to that? And and that's not that easy to do, okay? Because, I mean, let's look at my own life. I have spent a lot of years trying to not get to the edge of the cliff, doing everything I can to make sure that I'm not needy so I don't have to have God act. Sometimes I'm better at it than others, but I don't want to get right up on the edge where I have to trust God. I don't want to have to live by faith. I want to tell you about living by faith, and then I can just live by my own means. See? What a hypocrite. Some of you uh, knew uh, Steve Hayner. Uh, we worked together back at the New Press days, and then he went on to be president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and then uh, later... Columbia Seminary, um, and uh, he died a few months ago after about seven months of pancreatic cancer. And the, the lesson that he taught me that I've remembered my whole life, I probably shared it with you before, he said, it's only, wait, let me get this right, I want to get this right.
Until we get to the place where God is all we have, we'll never know he's all we need. Until we get there, and, and like, why do I spend so much energy trying not to get there? To make sure I don't get there. I'll be kind to people who aren't there, but I don't want to get there myself because I don't want to know that he's all that I got. And that he's all that I need. But when the brook dries up in our life, when that happens, we don't have to be afraid because that's the time to be expectant for what new thing God has for us in that. And uh, we, we had an incident happen uh, this week that um, I think it fits, so I'm going to share it, but it's not nearly as extreme as this, so it may seem trivial to you. It wasn't trivial to us. But um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, or first, our, our house payment was due, and we realized we didn't have any money for our house payment. And, uh, and I, I said, well, I can stall it about a week or so. Let's wait till next Sunday's offering. Maybe there'll be enough for the house uh, housing allowance, and then you know, we can make the payment. I go, oh, yeah, that's how God works. You know, we got Sunday coming. It's Tuesday. Sunday's coming, and uh, and then I came home the next Sunday and went, no, that that didn't work. That that plan didn't work. That's off the table. Um, and she goes, what are we going to do? Yeah. Sell sell some stocks. I went, well, no, see, we sold all the good ones. Now they're just crap stocks. They're just, you know, the dregs. Uh, they're not going to help. Oh. Do you have a plan? This is what she asked. Do you have a plan? <laughs> no, of course I don't. <laughs> you married me. Does that look like there was a plan in that? I, you know, I, I have no plan. We'll just, we'll see. And so, uh, a couple of days ago, she, she was getting ready to go down to California to take care of her little brother and uh, get separated, and she couldn't find the prescription uh, that she needed. And so we're tearing up the house. I'm literally tearing up, going through stacks of old papers and boxes and things stuck away and, and books and everywhere and trying to find this, this prescription. And, uh, and she came in and she had a little packet of papers and she said, uh, here's a packet of papers from your publisher, and it almost looks like there's a check at the bottom of this page. I go, well, that's stupid. It wouldn't be that. It's probably just a copy of one or something. And I'm looking at it. I go, if it was a check from last fall, we would have spent it. Uh, I kept looking, and I went, you know, I think there's actually perforation along there. Let's try it. <laughs> so we ran down and deposited in the bank and then waited two days to see if it would go through. Because it even said, you know, not good after 90 days, and this was November. Uh, and it went through. I think goes, I'm paying, this is going to pay the house payment for a couple of months. <clears throat> okay. All right. And then I looked at that and I went, wow, that's like an unkindness of ravens bringing food, you know? Uh, not what I expected, not the way I planned it. Thought I'd spit it. And it was there all the time. Because that's the point. It was there all the time. Sitting there, uncashed. While we're worrying, and Lord, when will you act? And Lord, don't you have something? And Lord, can't you make this work for us? And oh, blah, blah, blah. he's going, Westfall. He, he calls me Westfall. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it to you months ago. <laughs> if you would just use what I've given you. Now, I didn't like getting to the point where the Lord had to wake me up and teach me a lesson, particularly before this sermon, you know. <laughs> Why do I have to have these things happen before I preach the passage, you know? But, um, and I can't say, oh, next month he'll do it again. I, I don't know. But like Elijah, you know, when the brook dries up, 
All we've got is, well, Lord, what's next? And that becomes the fulcrum for ministry. See, the, the mistake that Elijah probably made here was he thought that it was about him. He thought that, well, the, the brook dried up, and so God better provide for me now. What has he got for me? A wealthy widow in the far town who's going to provide and take care of servants away on me. I have a nice room to myself. Everything's going to be great. What he didn't take into mind was that his problem and his need and his dried up stream was not for him. It was to help be the answer to prayer for this single parent family in another town that didn't know him and he didn't know them. He was the answer to their prayer. God just used the dried up stream to get him moving where he wanted it to be. Now you think about that and you go, okay, whose answer to prayer are you? Who, who's praying right now for someone or something to happen in their life to bring them hope and salvation and redemption you may not even be aware of? And it may be that the dryness in your life or the emptiness or the losses or whatever they are is just the fulcrum to move you into that place of ministry where God blesses somebody else through you. That's the call in Elijah. Now this story goes on and on and he does get really arrogant and taunting and rude and trash talking to the other priests. He was not uh, politically correct in his working with other religious groups. And, uh, and he does get suicidally depressed and wants to die, and he thinks he's the only faithful one. You know, all the church issues, you know. And, and uh, But right now, he's got nothing. And it's exactly what God wants him to have so that God could work through him to bless somebody else. I think that's our call. I think that's our call. My old boss used to say, don't ever waste a really bad experience. Don't waste a painful time. Don't let it just happen to you. Use it. Every time that painful, horrible thing happens, you look at it and you go, Lord, okay, you got my attention. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to help? How can we use this? I think that's our call today. And at the end of chapter 17, I love this. She started out saying, you know, that God of yours. Look at the, at the very end. The woman said to Elijah, now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord comes from your mouth and it's true. Now I know. It became a personal change. So let's pray, Lord, bring your personal changes to each one of us. And Lord, I confess, I, I don't like being near the, the dried up brook any more than anyone else. But help me not to be afraid. Help us not to hold back, but to trust you through it all. And Lord, we, uh, we long to hear your call and have the courage to respond to you in faith. That's our need. That's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.